Warning, the following presentation contains some graphic images of the devastation caused by wildfires, which some viewers may find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. My name is Diana Cervera, and I am the Education Program Manager for California Lawyers for the Arts San Diego office. California Lawyers for the Arts is thrilled to relaunch our Arts and in the Environment initiative, rooted in exploring the role of the arts in raising public awareness on the pressing environmental concerns that threaten our global well being. Over the next year, we will present a series of panel conversations as special topics within our educational workshop series. Welcome to the first webinar of this series, Arts and the Environment Wildfires, Water, and Environmental Justice. Before we begin, I'd like to share with you all a bit about California Lawyers for the Arts, which as some of you know, California Lawyers for the Arts is a statewide nonprofit organization serving the arts community by providing a number of legal and educational services across the state. And for those of you who are not already members, I'd like to share some of the benefits of purchasing a membership with CLA and encourage you to consider joining CLA as a member. Membership with us, allows you to save up to 50% or more on educational programs like this one, $15 off on every referral fee, and allows you to enjoy discounts on our soon to be released video on demand library of workshops and MCLE programs. You'll also have access to free recorded workshops in our upcoming foundational series, which will cover fundamental intellectual property topics. With your support, California Lawyers for the Arts continues to provide critically needed legal conflict resolution and educational programs for artists and arts organizations throughout California. To share a bit more about our programs and services, I'll play a short video from our Executive Director, Alma Robinson. Hello, my name is Alma Robinson and I am the Executive Director of California Lawyers for the Arts. CLA is a statewide nonprofit organization that was founded in 1974 to serve artists and arts organizations of all disciplines with advocacy as well as services that provide support with legal and business issues. With staffed offices in San Francisco, Berkeley, Sacramento, Los Angeles, and San Diego, we provide several core services. First, we provide legal counseling to specialized attorneys who provide assistance with a variety of intellectual property questions, as well as contract reviews and negotiations and other important business issues. Depending on the client's financial status, legal assistance may be available on a pro bono or reduced fee basis. We also provide a specialized program that assists independent inventors and small startups with their patent applications. To help with situations involving disputes, we provide a range of alternative services, including negotiations counseling, mediation, and arbitration that can avoid the expense and hassle of going to court. Finally, we offer a full menu of educational programs that include workshops, symposia, and conferences on various legal topics for artists and arts organizations. Many of these programs are posted on our YouTube channel, and we encourage you to use these tools to educate yourself on the legal issues before you reach out for specialized assistance from our organization. Thank you for joining today's program, and please consider joining CLA on our website at www.calawyersfortheartsorg so that we can continue to maintain our full range of services. Thank you. And without further ado, I would like to invite the first duo of speakers that we have joining us this evening from Siege, as I read a little bit of an introduction for you all. Siege is a collective of activists, academics, scientists, and artists working for decolonial environmental justice efforts translocally. Their members are in San Diego, San Francisco, El Paso, and Guerrero, Mexico. Siege aligns with indigenous struggles for land, water, and life. Their presentation will focus on the intersections of climate change, decolonial feminist science, and artivist practices. Specifically, they will discuss the role of artivism as a tool to critique eco-capitalism, greenwashing, and the false climate change solutions that are based on extractivist destruction of land and water. Leslie Quintanilla is an organizer, artist, and an assistant professor of women and gender studies at San Francisco State University. She's also co-founder of the Center for Interdisciplinary Environmental Justice, currently working alongside indigenous communities in South America and in the U.S. Southwest who are fighting against lithium mining. Jessica Ng 
is a writer, artist, and PhD candidate at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and also the co-founder for the Center of Interdisciplinary Environmental Justice. She is committed to building solidarity with frontline communities facing green extractivism and creating alternative climate futures. Welcome, Leslie and Jessica. Thank you so much, Diana, for that introduction and for CLA for inviting us to join. My name is Leslie and I'm here alongside Jessica. We're going to be talking about artivism against greenwashing. So currently you'll see in the slide that there is a cute comic that we're going to explain at the end for what it means for us to co-create art and, and aesthetics that will speak against current science that purports to be a solution for climate change and climate justice efforts. So we're going to start off by saying that we do want to honor the land and water defenders that have past that have been killed, that have been disappeared because of their fight and struggle and movements for water and land justice. Currently, there have been many that have been taken because they are fighting for life. And currently, there are those that are still fighting for water, that are still fighting for, for land, especially Indigenous communities around the global south and the global north that we will be talking about and speaking alongside. First, we are going to be talking about false climate change solutions. Then we're going to go into our work as Siege in terms of what it means to do decolonial feminist science. And then we're going to end with what it means to do decolonial climate justice work through education and through art. And before we get started, I do want us to kind of ground ourselves with one of the very prominent solutions that are sold to us in the current climate justice activist community, or especially in the corporate world, which is that of Tesla and Tesla vehicles. So for those of you that are attending, please let us know if you've seen either advertisements around, you know, the, the everyday walk that you do in the world or in, you know, the online world where Tesla is currently being ramped up as one of the climate change solutions because of the electrification of transportation and the electrification of vehicles. Especially here in California, we've seen Governor Newsom and a lot of climate action policies give a lot of money and a lot of investments, especially billions of dollars, to shift our fossil fuel extraction via electrification of vehicles. So while we understand that fossil fuel extraction has been a destructive evil in this world, especially because of capitalist structures, we do want to say that electrification of vehicles is still part of that structure. And we're going to explain why that is and why it's still an environmental destructive process to produce these vehicles. So I'm going to show a commercial that has currently occupied the digital web that really drives home this idea that in order to be a climate change agent in California, it is important for the population to shift to electric cars. So I'm going to show this video right now and ask you all just to see and ask yourselves what it is that this commercial and the folks behind it have asked us to understand about climate change. Drives a clean solution. An actor, have an activist, he fights to make a difference. He's a superhero with the reason to go electric. To go electric. Chloe has a superpower. Any day and any hour. To punch it and accelerate, flying down the interstate. She's a Californian with the reason to go electric. What? Me? Oh, I don't know if I can afford an electric car. Actually, you might be surprised. Hmm. Superhero, he's a Californian with the reason to go electric. Mama 
Electric car, truck, SUV, or minivan. That's right for you at electricforall.org. All right. So the homework assignment that you all got from me was, what do you notice about the climate change narratives or what is this commercial asking you to understand about climate change and your role in this cause? So what we understood from it or what I got from it, right, when I first watched it was that a lot of the clean energy or clean air is dependent upon driving said vehicles, right? Shifting our CO2 emissions that are usually from fossil fuels to a car or transportation that doesn't necessarily exude such emissions. And so therefore there's less pollution. While that is technically true, what is missing from this narrative is the fact that in order to produce these electric cars, the electric car batteries have to produce, supply, extract minerals and metals from the earth that require destructive processes that do cause a lot of pollution, a lot of environmental destruction, and a lot of community human rights harms that is unseen in the narrative such as that that we see in the commercial, where we do not understand that in order for one population or one region of the world, California, to get and produce clean air, there has to be another land, another body, another people that have to be sacrificed in order for these minerals to be extracted in order for the cars to be produced. And so extractive capitalism is a big subtext that is erased from said commercials or said artistic representations of climate change solutions because taking minerals and taking metals as resources are not necessarily clean, are not necessarily climate change goods, but are necessary for corporate profits that will make a lot of money from selling electric vehicles to Californians. And so currently there are many indigenous communities in Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, and also here in the Southwest US that are fighting against a mineral and metal extraction, particularly lithium extraction that is desecrating the waters that are necessary for these communities to continue surviving on this planet. And so one of the things that as a collective, as, a, as, as, as an organization we critique are the climate change narratives that really take for granted this idea and hegemonic notion of zero emissions, where we don't necessarily understand that the climate change narrative reduces only the solutions to reduce the, the, the pollution in the air, the CO2 in, in the air, and the, we therefore perpetuate the idea that we need colonial and capitalist extraction in order to produce zero emissions in one side of the world. And then we also perpetuate this idea that green technologies will save us during this just so-called just transition away from fossil fuels. And so we critique this, you know, kind of vehicle of culture, of music, of art that continues to uphold a system that sacrifices some communities, some lands, and some waters for their minerals, for the car batteries, for the electric vehicles, in order for the other some, like California or those that can afford these cards, to have the clean air. And so I'm going to pass it on to Jessica Ng right now, who's going to explain what it means for capitalist corporations to extract lithium, to extract nickel, copper, cobalt that are necessary currently for the production of electric cars and this current campaign for so-called green sustainable energy. Thank you, Leslie, for that intro and framing. So I'm going to focus on lithium and talk about where that comes from and why it's really harmful to be procuring this lithium at such high rates to create the batteries that store energy for electric cars and also for renewable energy storage in general, because lithium is the one that we as a collective started working with and working with communities on. So we got involved in this 
struggle about five or six years ago when we were responding to a call from indigenous communities in the Andean Altiplano. So this is like the highlands of northern Chile and Argentina and also southern Bolivia, although we don't have direct connections there. Indigenous communities in this area who have been resisting lithium mining for several decades, but now as lithium is becoming much more intensely extracted, that they're feeling that more and more intensely there in response. And so they were looking for science supporters and scientists to to help understand their groundwater and speak to them sort of through that through that language of data. And so that's how we got involved. And this area is really is really special. It's it's these desert highlands. It's the the driest desert in the world outside of the polar regions. And so the water underground here is really, really old. It, it came from past versions of, of climate that were wetter, that had that introduced more water into the system. And this water carried minerals from the surrounding mountains and dissolved those minerals and carried them into the low-lying basins where all these minerals collected over many, many thousands of years and formed this really mineral-rich brine that has lithium, it has potassium, it has all these other minerals that are commercially desirable. And so what the mining companies do here is they drill a hole in the ground and they pump up this ancient groundwater into these um, shallow pools on the surface, which you can see in the in the photo there. And that's the like sort of thin, flat trapezoid if you're following along in the diagram. And so they, they pump the water into these shallow pools and they let it evaporate under the intense sunlight and intense dryness of the desert. And so they're literally removing water. It's, it's groundwater mining, essentially. Lithium mining here is groundwater mining. And so they're removing water from the system in order to get the lithium out. And then, then they process it and take it out and turn it into batteries elsewhere in the world. That's one form of mining. That's the type of mining that's done in the Andes that we started working with communities on. There's a couple other types of mining. This one is a sort of maybe a more familiar type of mining that you might think of if somebody says mining, where you, you dig a big open pit in the ground and dig up the rock or clay that has a lot of lithium in it. And then what the mining companies do to get the lithium out is they, they leach it with sulfuric acid. So they're producing sulfuric acid locally, typically, and that has a lot of environmental impacts in terms of like the air pollution that's associated with that production and then the risk of spills as well. And so they, they use a sulfuric acid to get the lithium out of the rocks and they truck that lithium out. And then at the end, you have this toxic waste, which is called tailings, that's basically like acid washed rock. And then they build these artificial ponds to store that waste into eternity, basically. And those those ponds are susceptible to, to breaking and spilling. And that has happened around the world with other types of tailings ponds. And so this is, that's the second form of mining. And then there's another form of mining that is being promoted as like the environmentally friendly alternative to both of the other versions that are currently being done. And this is called direct lithium extraction. It's typically done where there's lithium in underground brine, kind of similar to the first one that I described in the desert with the, the water that's accumulated over thousands of years. But in this case, it's not necessarily a desert where the water has accumulated all these minerals. It's deep underground where the earth is hot and that heat dissolves minerals from, from the rock into the water there. So it's called geothermal brine and it's got both heat and minerals in it. And so these companies are typically coupling geothermal energy production with lithium extraction. And so they pump this hot, salty brine up. They turn the heat into electricity and then they also remove the lithium from that brine using various methods that vary company to company. And these are all proprietary, so they are like can't get a whole lot of detail about them. But some methods, like the one sort of in the diagram there, selectively filter out lithium. And then they re-inject the waste brine back into the underground aquifer. And so the impacts of this are still unknown because it's very new and it's has barely been introduced like in the real world yet. But some of the concerns that have come up are about how the aquifer will change because you're shifting water from one place to the other and changing the chemistry as well. You're reintroducing water with a different chemistry. 
and there's you know the possibility that it'll affect how what metals and minerals are are available in the water that could have human health impacts there's the risk of drying up springs as water is shifting from one place to another and all of these are really underexplored and under not considered very seriously by the mining companies that are really pushing this as like a green sustainable solution to lithium mining. And so there's lots and lots of lithium exploration across the Western United States. Currently, this is from a website called Desert Fog that has mapped out all the different exploration sites. Not all of them are active mines yet. Most actually none of them are yet. They're in the exploration phase but it's clearly expanding very, very quickly here and very broadly. And so to point out a couple of these sites, you know, I've talked about some of the environmental impacts, but the other part of this is the cultural impacts as well. So the top left picture is from Northern Nevada in a place called Thacker Pass or Pahimaha, which means rotten moon in the Paiute Shoshone language. And this is a massacre site that the indigenous people of that area, the the Paiute Shoshone people are trying to protect because, you know, their ancestors are buried there and have died there. And that in addition to all of the water use and extraction and the destruction of land, the destruction of habitat for species that only live in that area. There's also a sacred spring in Arizona, which is the picture on the right, called Hakamwe, which is on ancestral Wallapai land and has been used by various native peoples across the sort of Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico area who travel through that land and and use the spring to sustain themselves spiritually and physically as well. And there's exploratory drilling that's being pursued on the land directly surrounding the spring that would disturb the aquifer that feeds the spring. And then the closest to me in San Diego is in the Salton Sea area, which is the last picture in the bottom left corner. And this is an area that has really high unemployment, really low income, a lot of environmental health and environmental justice issues already with like dust from the Salton Sea and pollution associated with that. And this is an area where, where they're really pushing forward that third method, the direct lithium extraction which is, again, an experimental method whose impacts we don't really know yet. So the community is concerned about being a test site for that, basically. So Leslie, take over whenever you would like, but this is sort of what we've we've taken as approach as scientists, as a collective of, of natural scientists and social scientists and people coming from the humanities, understanding that science is political and that, you know, the, the goals of science have historically been to serve extraction, to serve capital, to serve the imperialism in the state. And so to use the tools and training that we have, that I have as a scientist, to understand some of the impacts and some of the effects and sort of be that bridge between the information that's being put out by the companies to be able to critique that and communicate with communities and and be in solidarity with them. And so we have developed this idea of a decolonial feminist science, which is a science for land and life and radical liberation rather than for all of the powers that already exist. Yeah. And I think to add on to that, it's important to see that It's important to produce knowledge and to produce ways of knowing the world that is for life. So if we think about working either in our labs, in our offices, in our education systems, where we're thinking about how can we protect water, how we can protect land, how we can protect people, instead of building upon our our jobs, our labor, and our knowledge systems that are reproducing capital, that are reproducing colonialism, that are reproducing destruction and profit. And I think it's important for all of us to think about the ways in which we are currently doing that by consuming a lot of the information that purports to be scientific solutions that instead only prioritize some over the others. And so it's important for us to think about the ways that these false climate narratives and false climate solutions like electric car batteries coupled with culture, music, and and visual art is part of what we're seeing as the greater structure of greenwashing where eco-capitalist art is is used at the service of of capitalism, of, of destruction, of displacement of indigenous peoples who have lived for thousands of years sustainably with the earth as seen through the example of the the ancient 
Asian aquifers in, in Chile and Argentina. And, and therefore, it was very important for us as an organization to think about the ways that we can use our, our tools as educators, our tools as scientists to create the art, to create the education tools that will fight back against this greenwashing of climate solutions like electrification of vehicles. So here um, you'll see one of the, of the comics that we produced collaboratively with artist Sophie Wang. And you'll see it's, it's, a, it's a vehicle that is being washed with green paint, but instead of, of actually destroying the, the technologies that are currently upholding colonialism and capitalism is just making it green. And I think here it's important to recognize that we're living in a time of massive transition, of an energy transition, of, a, of an infrastructure and storage way of extracting of minerals and metals that this shift has established the quote unquote green identity that crosses many lines, uniting disparate actors like Tesla drivers, like expert knowledge producers and social justice organizations that together are being urged towards a massive capital investment in these so-called renewable energies. And right now, as an organization, as individuals, we're really thinking about what it means to be grounded in solidarity with the indigenous water defenders to question the, the framework of an of a energy-centered, um, sustainably green technology that leaves intact the colonial and capitalist way of living. And so we're turning to, to what we think is a better solution, which is decolonization and really thinking about land back campaigns that will really build the, the social fabric of renewal, the, that will build the social fabric of life that does not necessarily continue to extract and destroy these environments and these waters. And here's a picture of, of a community in Argentina that protested the, the mining companies who are coming in to, to take their, their lithium through, through their water. And one of the signs says, respeten a nuestro territorio fuera empresa de litio, which means respect our, our territory, please leave mining company. And one of the ways that we're seeing that these false climate change solutions have been celebrated, especially in pop culture, is by the veneration of, of popular figures like Elon Musk, who's the, you know, the, the CEO of Tesla, especially with thinking about how, how he has been invited to, you know, Saturday Night Live, how he's really seen as the, you know, the tech god uh, of, of Silicon Valley. And, and really thinking how, you know, Tesla right now is going to gain a lot of money with the new lithium drive that, that is being signed in, in current government policies. And as an organization, we thought it was very important to intervene in the greenwashing that happens in popular culture by really, you know, speaking back against the, the normalization of environmental violence and in human rights violations that happens because a lot of, you know, communities, especially Silicon Valley, does put up figures like Elon Musk, who is a capitalist, who is a colonialist, who has actively explicitly said he does not care to, to think about the people and, and the animals that are being destroyed in, in order for him to get his lithium or the car batteries. And, and not just in pop culture and not just, you know, venture capitalists, but we're really seeing the push for, for extraction, for, for mining via government policies that are right now on their way of being signed. So this is an old article that came out on Vice about a year ago, where the demand for, for electric vehicles and solar panels was on the rise. And, and Biden really started to do the planning process for these minerals and metals to be mined in the US domestically. And just today, I got some screenshots just for this presentation, where the Defense Production Act might get signed and most likely will get signed tomorrow by Biden in order to ramp up the production of, of these domestic minerals and metals. And what we're really scared of as an organization and as other organizations who are working alongside the very communities, the frontline communities who will get affected, who will get displaced because of this mining, is that we really have to ramp up our solidarity, our joint struggle, our very much critical lens on such policies that are coming from the White House. So now I'll pass it on to, to Jessica for, for the importance of producing knowledge and producing artwork that does the work of intervening in such destructive policies. So I'll kind of go through a survey of some of the materials that we have put out as an organization. And they're all in this anti-greenwashing educational toolkit that we put together on the website, which we definitely encourage you to check out and share if you would like to, if you find it useful. And so if we go to the first one here, this is the comic that was on the title side of our presentation called Salt to Stars. And so we worked with an artist 
who also has critiques of science and how science is done, named Sophie Wong. And she helped us illustrate this narrative of the lithium mining impacts due to brine extraction in the Andes, which I talked about earlier. But this is like, we thought it was really useful to put it into a more visually attractive format that could be, you know, used by, by kids, by, by anyone, hopefully. This is a map that I've been working on that's not out yet, but is getting closer. That's locating the areas of lithium extraction globally. I'm not trying to be super precise about like it, like how many projects there are because you, you can't keep up with how many are being, you know, pursued and explored and then sort of passed over and changing hands all the time, but to sort of lay out the, the regions where this is happening and some of those environmental and cultural impacts. The next one is a short story that I wrote last year and submitted to a climate fiction short story contest that was put on by Grist. And it was not a finalist in that contest, but it will be published in the Hopper in a couple of months for this spring edition. And so it's a narrative that is very much grounded in the work that I've done with Siege working with frontline community members, but also kind of goes into like my diasporic positionality and family history and looks at the, the interconnectedness that we have between this region in California where we're pushing for electric cars and the places where those raw materials come from and the people there. And then we have, we've been working with a filmmaker named Taylor Reese on a film that explores the stories of the indigenous communities in South America and also we'll be connecting them to the the stories of the indigenous communities in the southwest so right now we're gonna end by showing the trailer of this film it's not public yet but we think that it's important to show this to this audience so hopefully we'll have good questions at the end sacan de las lagunas, de la cordillera, el agua que traen para procesar el litio. Da pena de como aún estuvieran sacando la, la sangre. Es como la, el que está la madre tierra, la pata joiri, y le están extrayendo la sangre igual que un ser humano. Y nuestra como visión es respetar la madre tierra. Yo no digo esta tierra me pertenece, yo digo yo le pertenezco a esta tierra. Y mientras yo la tenga, la voy a cuidar, la voy a trabajar, la voy a hacer producir, que me va a servir para mi sustento. Y el día que nosotros perdamos ese pensamiento, yo creo que nuestro pueblo va a desaparecer. Esta es una bomba donde bombean agua del núcleo. Estaban a 80, 100 metros, pero ahora la nueva empresa dice que quiere perforar a 400 metros. Esta es una. Cada vez se va bajando más el lo que es la salmuera hacia abajo. Con la empresa del litio, con estos autos eléctricos que dicen que él es como que se va a salvar el planeta y, y no creo que se vaya a salvar el planeta. Yo creo que esto, si queremos un cambio, tiene que partir de nosotros, de ser más ser humano, de ser más, más hermanables, más hermanos y, y juntarlo. Pues. Con la plata no es nada. El agua sí, el agua, si no tenemos agua no sobrevivimos, pero no todo es plata, algún día se van a acabar lo, los recursos naturales y vamos a quedar sin nada. Ya ahí no va a valer ni los teléfonos, no van a valer ni los autos, va a valer nosotros como personas. Cuando llegaron las minas, hace como 50 años atrás, el litio no era muy importante. Y después con esto, cuando viene 
ya el boom de la tecnología, que vienen los computadores, los celulares, todos con baterías de litio, esto agarra vuelo. Empezamos a, a luchar por el agua, que los robaban el agua, lagunas milenarias que estaban, que desaparecieron. Y ahí es donde nosotros reaccionamos de que, que tenemos que ser consultados como pueblos originarios, que, tenemos, que somos dueños del territorio y que esto nos pertenece, y que no a cambio de la tecnología, a cambio de, de los autos eléctricos, no podemos desaparecer. Somos tan seres humanos como la gente que está en, en otros países y, y tenemos el derecho a vivir, y a vivir en paz y en armonía. Nadie desconoce ni cuestiona el reclamo que ustedes están haciendo. Lo que se le está cuestionando es para ejercer su derecho, ustedes están vulnerando el derecho de otras personas. No solamente una lucha de hace dos o tres días, nosotros venimos hace varios años con tema litio y ahora no tener respuesta nos vemos obligados a tomar estas medidas porque es el único lenguaje que entienden los gobiernos, lamentablemente. No tenemos ninguna denuncia ni registro de disminuciones de agua eh, de lo que ustedes están planteando ahora. Yo creo que nosotros tenemos que luchar hasta el último por cada gota de agua porque otra vez nosotros vienen nuestros hijos, nietos, y ahí nos, nosotros no podemos dejarlo sin agua, se pierde toda una cultura. Entonces nosotros por eso hemos pedido una asamblea, hemos pedido que venga el que es el responsable y que tenga la respuesta clara y, y para toda esta gente. Yo creo que lo mejor es contactar al gobernador y que digan qué día y a qué hora va a estar presente acá en la asamblea de las comunidades. Si ustedes levantan la medida de fuerza, acordamos una fecha para que el gobernador venga. Si no hay levantamiento de la medida de fuerza, el gobernador no va a venir. No, a partir de hoy es no. No nos interesa el litio. ¿Por qué? Porque nos violaron todo el derecho. Y ahora nosotros decimos no. no. La palabra dice no. No al litio. No al litio. No. No. Esto tiene que ver para las futuras generaciones. Y como lo dejaron nuestros abuelos, nosotros queremos dejarlo a nuestros niños, a futuras generaciones que vean lo hermoso y lo importante que es para sobrevivir aquí en este desierto. Es un todo. Es un todo. Es un ciclo. Para nosotros la, la tierra es lo más sagrado. Que sin ella no existiría. Eso. Y yo pienso que si, si el mundo toma esa conciencia del hombre indígena, es la salvación del planeta. Thank you all so much for having us. We're going to end by just saying that it's important for us to strengthen our transnational indigenous solidarity. We have many calls to action coming up. So please just follow us on our website, the siege.org or on Instagram, Decolonize for Climate. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Leslie and Jessica. I just want to thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. I learned so much just listening to both of you. So I definitely have some questions that I'll share at the end. So next, I would like to invite up our next duo of speakers, Douglas and Noah. Thank you all for being here. I'll read a, a quick file and then I'll, I'll pass it over to each of you. So Douglas McCullough is Senior Curator at UCR Arts, California Museum of Photography and a Practicing Artist. McCullough is an honors graduate of the University of California, Santa Barbara and holds an MFA in photography and digital media from Claremont Graduate University. Exhibitions curated by McCullough have shown in a range of venues, to name a few, Kennedy Center for the Arts in Washington, DC, 
Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, Centro de la Imagen in Mexico City, Falcon Arts Center in Moscow, and among many others. And Douglas and Noah actually will both be speaking about their involvement in facing fire, art, wildlife, and the end of nature in the West. Douglas was the curator for this, and Noah was one of the photographers. And I'll read a bit about Noah because both of you are also so amazing and interesting. Noah Berger is a freelance photographer. His career spans 26 years, shooting for editorial, corporate, and government clients. Noah specializes in wildfires, social unrest, and other edgy situations. After covering the 2013 Rim Fire outside of Yosemite, Noah began devoting summers and autumns to documenting California's major wildfires. Along with colleagues at the Associated Press, Noah received the 2021 Pulitzer Prize in Breaking News Photography for his coverage of the Black Lives Matter protests. He was a 2019 Pulitzer Prize finalist in Breaking News Photography for his images of California's deadliest fire season. So Noah and Douglas, the floor is yours. Very excited to hear your presentation. All right, it's great to be here. I'm gonna start, but I'm sure Noah will jump in and heckle because that's his, that's his norm. I, I'll share a screen and talk a bit about Facing Fire, which uh, was already mentioned an exhibition I curated at the California Museum of Photography, which is the photography museum of the University of California. So I'll, there are 16 artists in the exhibition and Noah is one of them. So he, he Noah really is one of the, uh, possibly the premier fire photographer in California. There are a number of them, a small number that sort of specialize in fire, but Noah's been at it longer and more ferociously and with a greater level of kind of dedication and insanity, I have to say. So rather than, than talk about other photographers of, of a photojournalistic type, which Noah is sort of how Noah operates, I thought I would talk about a couple other artists in the show. This is an installation shot at the California Museum of Photography. The show was opening actually June 4th at the St. George Museum. It's traveling and then we'll be in Washington State and then at Harrison Museum of Art, which is part of Utah State University. So it's, it's starting to travel. How I got into this subject of wildfires is really two part. One, it's being a Californian, born and raised in California in LA and watching the increasing ferocity of fires. And the second is running across some pretty amazing fire photography. So I, I'm showing one here that's one of Noah's photos. I was doing a previous show about kind of environmental and landscape photography in a, in a certain portion of, of Southern California. And I ran across this, this photo from 2016, the Blue Cut Fire. It's kind of near the Cajon Pass, if people in Southern California know where that is. But what's amazing about this, and when the print is really huge, is that you it's like an, a world of embers. You, you lose scale. You can't really tell. It's like the whole world has been engulfed in this fire. So this photo was in that previous exhibition, which then sort of prompted me to start tracking down, not just having met Noah, but starting to track down all these other artists and photographers who are deeply engaged in fire. It's really wonderful actually to transition from water to fire. We're very elemental here. <laughs> it's, it's pretty pretty great and also very centered on, you know, changing the planet. This is another one of Noah's photos. This is actually called a, a, a friend of his, Justin Sullivan, another fire photographer. So this is Justin Sullivan shooting low at the campfire in 2018. Justin's like laying in this river of sparks and shooting. And this is one of Justin's photos from the Kincaid fire a year later, 2019, shooting into sparks, blowing in the wind. So essentially that's what he's doing here. He's getting these long trails of the sparks blowing by and embers blowing by, which is a pretty insane way to make a living in my opinion. Um, Noah can speak to that. <laughs> that's actually the same moment. That's him actually taking that picture that I've shot him. It's is that a, right? Uh, yeah, oh, people ask me that and I was, I thought that wasn't, yeah, that is so great. The moment, yeah. It's pretty fantastic. But I, I start to, having looked at a lot of fire photographs by you, you crazy people, I start to see some of the tactics, which are, were quite wonderful. And one of them is like shoot straight into the blowing embers and, and get streaks. What's interesting too is that for me, it's always like, what, it, what are the images about or what are the photographs about or what are the art about? But it's what else is it about? And clearly, 
you know, mankind is utterly linked to fire. We carry fire, we spread fire, we're enabled by fire. If we didn't have fire, I mean, the earliest caves from hundreds of thousands of years ago have charcoal hearths. If we didn't have fire, we wouldn't be who we are. So it's essentially fire is an elemental force that, but it's one that we can call forth. And it, it, I mean, try calling forth a flood or a tornado or an earthquake or something. You can't do it. We have domesticated fire. You, you know, we're reading you know, gas prices are up. Gas is enables fires in our pistons of our stoves. I mean, we are enabled by fire on every level. So the thing about fire though, is it's the cooking hearth, but it'll also like burn your house down. So it's a complicated relationship. And artists in this exhibition play with that relationship, not just photographs, but some others. Since Noah is such a great, great photographer and will show you a bunch of stuff, I wanted to focus on a couple of other artists. Fire is like the root metaphor for mankind. It's passion, it's punishment, it's lust, but it's also the lake of fire. There, there's a, I have an entire book of fire as metaphor. It's the spark of inspiration, the blaze of anger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's the funeral pyre, purification. It, it's kind of the, a central metaphor for mankind. That's how deeply entwined we are with it. One of the artists in the exhibition is a kind of conceptual ceramicist from LA, although she's now teaching in Texas, Anna Meyer. And this is really one of the great projects in the, in the, in the exhibition. What she did is she made 12 ceramic pieces. They're about the size, this is one of them. And they're about the size of a torso and they're rolled out and they have inscribed on them a, you know, a statement. They're all different kind of open-ended mysterious statements. And what she did is she barely bisque fired these. I'm a photo guy, right? I'm a photo historian and photo curator, but so bisque firing is like the first step. So they aren't fully fired. And then what she did is hike these pieces into canyons up and down the Malibu coastline, an area that's notorious for periodic fires. You know, there's always like fires that start inland and then blow in heavy winds out to the ocean until they stop. So that placing 12 of these out in the canyons was the intention was that they would be fired by a wildfire, but it might not even happen in her lifetime. It's like a conceptual gesture. It's sort of like art as a proposition. And then what she started to do was as time went on and years went by, every year she would send out these postcards about the project. And it's called Fireful of Fear. So every year there were signed postcards in addition that went out to a list of people. Her position on this she did a whole set of watercolors of what they might be like if and when they were fired. So that was 2014, six years in, nothing's been fired. This is sort of, she regards it as eco-feminist land art. It's like land art on a human scale rather than the land artists like Michael Heiser or many others who go out and bulldoze the land. These are pieces that if they're never fired, they just go back into the earth. So it's kind of a wonderful thing. It's also about, she says, women and the act of waiting. So eventually, this is one of Noah's photos. In 2018, in November of 2018, there was the Woolsey fire. It burned 1,600 structures, killed three people, and it fired six of her 12 pieces that were out on that coast area. She managed, after she could get back in, she recovered four of them. Two were lost in lands. One just dis disappeared completely. One was last in a landslide. And so what we have in the exhibition is a fired piece that the inscribed uh, statement says, old epic stories handed down into the hands of storytellers. It's, it's pretty great. The whole project, you know, really is at a moment of planetary reckoning. The fires, as you've noticed, I think the last I checked, the 18 of the 20 largest fires ever in California history are in the last 10 years. It might now be 19. They've been getting bigger and bigger, more and more destructive, not just because there are more houses, but because the scale and scope is larger. So at this point, 
you know, in the Anthropocene, fire is something new. It's now, you know, the world is unbalanced. We're at the end of a stable world. We don't know where this is going. For a fire photographer like Noah, it's like, great, fires all the time. For the rest of us, I'm, I'm not quite so sure. I'm getting close to the end of my short 15 minutes, but I'll, I'll just briefly flash through one more artist. This is Norma Quintana, who lives up in the Bay Area, in Napa, actually. And in 2017, on the, on the night of October 8th, there was the Atlas Peak Fire that started just the southeast of Napa. It was one of a whole set of fires, or 14 fires, that eventually became called the Northern California Firestorm. They burned for months, actually, in about 8,400 homes. One of them was her house and studio. She and her husband and kids had five minutes to leave and thought they were just leaving. Eventually, when she got back, she started sifting through the ashes and taking out everyday objects, a watch. She was wearing these gloves. All of her cameras had been burned. She's a photographer. And so here's an here's installation view of a whole wall of just ordinary objects set onto the glove that she was using. So it's like this kind of wonderful reference to a hand, in this case, a hand on a hand, or scissors. It, it's the most poignant thing ever. It's about recovery. It's about memory. Here's one of her cameras. There were five photographers, Noah being one, Justin Sullivan, who you saw, shooting into the sparks, Jeff Frost, Stuart Paley, Josh Edelson, all at the opening of the exhibition. And she stood in front of this and talked about her experience and just happened to ask, were any of you photographers at this fire, the Atlas, Atlas fire? All of them were at that fire. So they all photographed the fire that burned her house. At the very, very end, deep into the layers and layers of ash, just white ash, almost nothing paper survived. But days into digging out these things, she found this photo of her kids with one of the neighboring kids that survived. And she said, I just, I sat in the ashes and I cried. Noah, you're on. That was a very heavy moment, believe me. I, um, if you, yeah, my name's Noah Berger. I'm a freelance photographer, largely for the Associated Press, doing fires. And thanks for bringing me on, Doug. I love hearing his voice and seeing him every chance I get. So this is cool. I was going to show you guys some of my work, talk about what we do. No, Noah, by the way, is in the airport in Washington, D.C. So yeah. I am. So if you hear announcements about gates, there is a reason. Here's a quick video snippet from last year. And this is a GoPro on my dashboard. I also show stuff Doug hasn't seen yet, so he would be interesting. And the clearance. Hey, buddy, we're, uh, we're heading north on Frenchman Boulevard. It's the one that's on the west side of the lake. The fire's rolling downhill here. Uh, Ron and I are going to make it through. We're going to go check out Frenchman's Village. I believe it's that private on the north end of the lake. Break. Ah. I'll let you know when we get there, try to reach combo with you again. Uh, but uh, this thing's going to touch down on Frenchman Boulevard here in the next hour, I say, or less. So the reason that you see all these amazing not just me, but in general, all these stunning fire pictures from California is that we have press access that other states don't have. It's a part of the penal code that guarantees press access to these closed emergency zones. Just this week, Oregon approved a similar legislation, which starting next year, you should start seeing these photos out of Oregon, which is awesome. There are downsides to it too. But for now, that's if you ever wonder why you don't really see these photos out of Colorado or Texas or other places that have crazy fires, that's why. This is all work from this year. This is the Sugar Fire, which was kind of just north of Reno. One of the things we always try to do at fires is capture PG&E equipment because a lot of them are started by PG&E, so it can come in handy later. <laughs> um, I think it turned out this fire was not started. I think I think the sugar fire was lightning, but as you guys probably know, Pagini and what's the Southern California one? Kind of Edison. Yeah, Edison, Southern California, Edison. Yeah. yeah, this was pretty wild. These guys were watching this house burn and one of them lost his house the year before and the other lost his house earlier in the day and they were just standing in the bar watching downtown Doyle burn. Just gonna flip through some. One of the things we do is we look for the human angle. There's so many elements in this photo. I really like how this came together. This is at the Dixie Fire this year. These are shots from Dixie. Yeah, I love that photo. That's great. It reminds me a little bit of like street photography or Gary Winogrand talked about trying to include so much in the photo that it almost falls apart. <laughs> and, and I pushed it past, like it fell apart with just that hand over on the left side that just put it over the edge. And, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. One of the things that we do in California, I don't know, 
you guys are on the environmental oh, side, so I just thought I'd share is that a lot of the land is burned off by firefighters who are trying to stop the blaze by depriving it of vegetation to burn. So this is what they're doing here. They're creating a backfire that's hopefully creating a containment line on the Dixie fire. Sometimes that fails. You get these, you know, no matter what they do, if you have 60 mile an hour winds and 5% humidity, you know, the fires could blow past lines. Still all the Dixie fire here. Wow. See, I told you I'd find stuff you hadn't seen. Um, <laughs> most of the, what we do is negative news. I did write a story last year in this guy and photographed it. It's pretty cool. He just, him and his daughter just started bringing donated RVs to fire victims and he's on his hundredth RV and he just brings this RV, drops it off, hands over the keys and title and that's it. Seriously? Um, wow. Yeah, so if you look him up, he's really interesting. Woody Faircloth is his name. What? Um, so there is a question here, which is yeah. a technical one. How do you keep, how do you keep cameras from overheating, and what kind of camera do you use to, to accomplish that? Sure. I've always been Nikon. Uh, originally, I was D5s. Now I switched to mirrorless, which is the Z6. You actually don't really have too much trouble with that. The only tr I've had one time when it said too hot to operate and that lasted like five minutes and then it was okay. I'm going to have three cameras with me and the heat doesn't really affect it like you'd think it would. And these are Southern Oregon, which the only way to cover it when this happened last two years ago was by drone because you can't get in as press. In fact, I actually got booted from areas that were open to the public by the sheriffs, even though I said, you know, this isn't really constitutional what you're doing here. You can't boot someone who's a member of press from an open public area, but they didn't really care. So hopefully we will be on the ground covering Oregon fires and doing that. So these are drone photos taken from across the highway. I work with guys who I work with were dressed like firefighters. This is me. It looks like I'm carrying a goat out of a burning building, but I'm not. It was, I mean, I was helping this firefighter who was alone doing things, but I didn't like run out of the building with the goat. We have full Nomex top and bottoms, hard hat, fire shelters, which is like a piece of aluminum foil that theoretically and improves your odds of surviving if you get burned over um, I, i've heard them called turkey cookers though that doesn't shake, turkey cookers shake and bake <laughs> um if you, the the wisdom is if you end up in a situation where you have to use when somebody made a mistake along the line you do not want to it probably helps you a little bit but you do not want to ever have to deploy your fire shelter these are some of the guys who i work with that douglas mentioned we work as a team and a family we're there for each other we have each other's backs both on fires and the rest of the year we understand each other a lot of time when we get back from fires our minds are still at the fire for two or three days and we come back to kids or wife and your mind's still at the fire and these are the people who you know you share your ideas and your passion with and we'll just spend days texting each other and calling each other after i love these guys you know they have my back i have theirs here's another uh, another question yeah. uh, can you share a bit about the process of preparing for for this work and, and what made you first approach a fire so i i guess sure yeah. sure sure yeah so I got into it in about 2013, which was the rim fire outside of Yosemite, which at the time was massive. It didn't cause a lot of damage, but it was massive by those standards. Now it's kind of quaint. It was just under 300,000 acres, which was dwarfed by like the Dixie fire at a million. But that was when I got into doing this. And I, I've been a news photographer for 26 years, but I kind of said, this is what I want to do with my summers and falls. And started getting more knowledge, learning more about firefighters, getting more equipment which can mean we have two-way radios for our cars to communicate. We have carbon monoxide detector. A lot of the time when we're in a fire, we'll leave the cars running for four days straight. You leave it, you leave it running when you're near flames so that it will start again. And then at night, we'll leave it running for air conditioning. So it's pretty common for us to run our cars for three or four days without turning off. <laughs> so we get carbon monoxide detectors for that, things like that. Just improving your knowledge, some online training, some training both online and in person from fire officials. I've never been hurt or seriously afraid. This was kind of one of the worst injuries was something from a burning building got into my eye and it actually affected me for a couple months after. I guess probably fiberglass or some other chemicals, but you can see that does not look like a fun morning. But we're never really in situations where we haven't been where we thought we were going to die. Or I thought, this is the Although you interpreted it slightly different, but I think, right, so my, my takeaway was 15 of the 20 most destructive in California have occurred in the past seven years, which is really wild. 15 out of 20 of the most destructive in seven years. It's a crazy statistic. Yeah, I know. It's just ramping up. I, I talked, you know, working on the exhibition, just to throw it in really quickly, a bunch of fire ecologists. 
And they said, hey, get used to it. It's just going to carry on that way. You know, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So many so. temperatures keep rising and, you know, and drought. Yeah. 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 I'm a little reluctant to, and this is probably the wrong group to say this. I'm definitely not a climate change denier. I'm definitely not knowledgeable enough to say that climate change is why we've had these crazy seven years. Obviously, every degree hotter that it is, the fires are going to be worse. The season's going to be worse. We're still looking at a very small period that I think a lot of it is the drought that's causing it. But I'm not a scientist and I don't try to answer those questions. Yeah, I think the, the fire ecologists say the largest single cause is actually fire suppression for 120, 30, 40 years. Every fire you can put out, you put out. And eventually when they take off in 60 mile an hour winds and super dry and you have a kicker, on top of, of, you know, hotter weather, climate change, then look out. Yeah. You're breeding monsters is what they say. Yeah. For sure. And that in addition to people building in what's called the wireland urban interface, the buoy, more and more homes being built against the forest, being affected by that. Also the firefighters, again, it's past my knowledge, but firefighters are all proponents of more logging. They tend to Almost every firefighter you talk to thinks that more logging is part of the answer, not the whole answer, but part of it. Just conveying the opinion, not expressing mine. <laughs> Can you talk about how you navigate the ethics of documenting human tragedies? Yeah, there's a lot of ethics. Me and my friends, especially Josh Edelson, we kind of love these ethical questions. We spend a lot of time thinking about it and debating it. There's some ethics that are set by newspapers and there's some that we have to figure out. One example, this was at the campfire where normally the sheriffs don't let us do this, but they let us follow them for body recovery for days. So we spent days doing this. And in other fires, they would have closed it off five blocks away. And I think the sheriffs made a conscious decision to let us follow them. And Josh had a photo from this that was this gruesome photo. It was a charred body and it looks like the woman's crawling out like in pain, which I don't think is what's happening. But I mean, he's got this insanely powerful frame and he was working for a European outlet who doesn't have the same aversion to gore that we do here and his editors were like yes yeah, send it over we'll put it out and you know we all discussed it and it's very hard to hold on to a photo like that it was very powerful it would have had consequences i mean i think you would look at pg e differently seeing this photo versus just knowing they started a fire but we decided not to put it out for several reasons access being one of them what the family would think like if you think you're if you have this thought that your mom died somewhat peacefully and then you see this photo of her on her driveway, but it's complicated. This is actually the spot where that body was found. This is much less graphic, but this was that body that he photographed up close. This was an interesting one on ethics. This is one which was weird. AP didn't want to put this out at first because it was too graphic, which is kind of weird when you look at Vietnam photos, Eddie Adams and things like that. It was a fishing game guy euthanizing a llama. So we put this one out. Eventually they did put it out. I kind of had to argue it. Other ethics, showing dead animals, get a lot of reader hate for something like this. You get a lot of people like, how could you do that? How could you share someone's horse? And my thinking is that if it's what is, we show it. Obviously there are limits to that and we're always creating those limits like with Josh's body, you know, body photo. Here's another good ethics one. This was the campfire and this was before we knew anyone had died. Uh, so we were up that up there about three hours after it started four hours and this was a car dealership burning in paradise and then obviously after a day when you realize 85 it wasn't 85 at the time but the dozens of lives reader i did get a lot of comments like god that's sick how could you put out something that's making fun of this and i think that's a valid thing i mean we didn't know i didn't know when i filed this i would have thought differently if we knew dozens of people had died and the reader the reader comments are interesting like that. I, I appreciate it. Well, thank you first and foremost to all of you for presenting your work, presenting your perspectives, and to be the first speakers on our newly launched series, Art in the Environment. Hope it will not be the last one. But yeah, I think with both presentations, there's almost these presentations of two extremes, extreme extraction, right? Where water is being like depleted to one extreme and the earth being pushed. You know, I'm, I'm also not a scientist. Jessica, maybe you can chime in on this, but like some of, you know, the extreme weather we're seeing here in California, extreme fires that, as you all mentioned, you know, it's growing in the last seven years. So thinking about that, yeah, do you all have any comments for each other? Maybe before I dive in, Jessica, do you have any insights on that or, or Noah or Douglas on, on the siege presentation? 
no pressure. If not, I can jump into the other questions. I like the nice things that Douglas say. said about me. <laughs> <laughs> I try and he, he pays me to say those things. Um, you know, it's funny because I'll just make the, the brief comment that I grew, my father was a geologist. So I kind of grew up with these time scales that were really extreme. If it wasn't, you know, 16 million years, he thought it was like, you know, not worth dealing with. So that, you know, in Southern California, you look at the Palos Verdes Peninsula, which is this tall, you know, nice houses and whatever. And it's got ocean benches all the way up and down. And there's ocean benches. The, the, client, the, the planet is in constant flux. What's happening is with mining, extraction, overuse of water, climate change, we're changing it super fast. I mean, we just are, there's no question about it. And you have, it's irresponsible not to do something about it. That's a political stance. That's my stance. That's not coming from dealing with uh, fire or, you know, knowing something about groundwater overuse and extraction or lithium that I, you know, kind of stay conversant on. And that's just, that's what we should do. We should be good stewards of the planet. It, it's crazy to be act otherwise somehow. Just Who's going to disagree with that, though? <laughs> I'll say thank you so much for sharing those incredible images and videos. I've never really seen fire pictures like that. I guess I've never really gone looking for them, but it was really, really striking. And also thanks for tackling the ethics question. My, my roommate actually has been getting into photography recently and is thinking about those questions a lot. And so I was like, oh, this is a good opportunity to ask a professional about, about those. You know, I'm sure there's situations that come up that you've never come across before and you just have to kind of on the fly figure out what to do. I, I think one question that came in earlier that I think applies to everyone, and I'll, I'll toss it to you first, Jessica, because I know you're waiting for a while too and everyone can answer it, but it said, what made you decide to leverage art for activism as opposed to other communication strategies? How does it function differently? What impact do you expect it to have? How do you measure its impact? I'm going to tackle some of that. I mean, art certainly isn't the only method of communication that I use or that we use as a collective. Um, we do like workshops and classroom visits as well, you know, things like that. But I think art, I mean, this is kind of mostly talking about like visual art, I guess, because there's a lot of different forms also that you could. I think that art, it, it carries a lot of weight to it that that other forms of communication don't always. Like it, it, it carries this emotional sort of push or pull and connection to between the whoever is creating the art and whoever is experiencing it. And maybe those are the same person. But I think that's that's a big part of it. And it can kind of communicate things in ways that are difficult to express in language or in in other forms and we also like you know just in the modern world live in a very visually centered sort of society currently with you know social media and all these things and so it's sort of a good opportunity to to spread messages and there's a lot of there's sort of two sides to that sword because there's there's ways that you know, information gets spread in in ways that are not good as well but it's it's one of many tools and then I just I like art so <laughs> um, <laughs> you know it's something that I enjoy creating and thinking about and so why not do the thing that interests you and, and that you find fun and enjoyable so that's sort of my answer I'll, I'll quickly very in very short form argue both sides of that on on the one hand as far as photography goes I mean we just saw in all of Noah's photos and we've been looking at images moving or still from Ukraine. And it, it's powerful. You know, you mentioned Vietnam photos. They really, in some ways, changed the trajectory of the war. So the veracity of photos, like they're stenciled off the real, something real, we believe something real happened in front of that camera and it was captured, give them, give them a, can give them power. The other side, to argue the flip side, is a great war photographer, Steve McCurry, who's just absolutely one of the great war photographers, said there have been thousands of years of, of, of statesmen and diplomats and politicians trying to stop war. I think it's probably unrealistic to think a photograph can do that. And so there's a real limit to what photographs or images can do. And so on the one hand, they you can say, oh, you can make a case they're powerful. On the other hand, he says, yeah, 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 right. You know, <laughs> mankind has tried to do this, this, and this, and suddenly you expect art to do that. I think that's unrealistic. I don't know. Or, so or I kind of see that. I think too. I think of this way that art accompanies, right? It can accompany movements. It's it it, it itself maybe won't stop the war, won't be right. the thing that change, you know, stops climate, 
change, but it can hopefully, right, like call people to action, which kind of leads me to the question I wanted to ask before Noah leaves and to you all for with the exhibition, like what were some of the impressions and reactions? I mean, I know here, us being able to experience some of the photographs and even hearing from you, Noah, and your process in going into these fires and seeing the devastation and the folks that are affected, what, what were some of the impacts of folks attending the, the exhibition? I mean, I, I would say that I, as a curator, I, you know, I didn't make any of these photographs. I, I was sort of tried to just be a conduit of these photographers and there was video as well so that and create an, a really immersive environment so that you you were surrounded by these photographs and you really you know felt like you were in the space all the walls were like dark charcoal everything's lit there are these glowing things on on the wall and a huge rear projection screen of video and so i think there there was a certain impact to it and the Norma Quintana photos and similar ones like the aftermath, all of the burned objects from her house, from her life actually, were at the end. And so then you kind of like the impact of what all these fires are about. And finally ethics, you know, it's like, <laughs> like what, what do you show? What do you show in the aftermath of the fires? So, you know, there was, it, there was uh, I think, a gratifying response to the to the work. I would give credit to all the artists, actually. Any thoughts for you? No, I know, sort of like with your work, I think it does illuminate some of these issues. I know you kind of mentioned maybe that's not like the intention, perhaps, of the work, but ha is there anything there for you that has like arisen when people experience your work or connecting it as like this evidence or as this proof of, you know, climate change or these extreme places our earth is being, you know, pushed to? Sure. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to create them and have people use them to illustrate different things that they've researched, that they know about, that they're you know, that they're working on. I definitely don't approach it from an activist. I do a lot of political stuff too, you know, left and right wing. And it's all approached as a news photographer. I don't have, I don't have skin in the game. I'm not trying to affect change, which I think is somewhat of a strength because you look at these and you can't say there's an ulterior motive. You know, it's just what it is. That's what it looks like there. And my approach, I would try to do, create to capture what's real and what's truthful and in, in an artistic way as possible. So that's my goal. But I think that's one of those strengths of a news photo is that you can trust it. Doug, Doug is smiling, maybe his new project will disprove that, but to a large extent, you can trust news photos that they are showing peak action. So it's not like they're showing the whole town and how everything else is still okay, but you can trust them to be true. Yeah, they're, they're true, but there's always something outside the frame too. Yeah, you know, yeah. No, Noah, Noah is an artist. I think that the, the photojournalists who, who treat the real world and try and report on the real world, but raise it to the level that Noah does, I'm like, I'm, that, 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 at that point, it's art. It becomes art, in my opinion. And I have one more question for, for C, just when I had written down. I know that the concepts you all present, right, is kind of like uh, pitted against, like, you know, these multi-million dollar campaigns that are, you know, saying go green right like these celebrities political figures so what are the some of the challenges you all face i know you work you know very deeply with communities that are the ones that are firsthand experiencing the detriment and like the impacts of lithium mining or these extractive methodologies right to kind of fuel our cars on this side of the planet so what are some of the maybe challenges you know anything any insights you want to share around that the work that you all do i think one of the challenges is the the speed and the urgency with which everything is happening like you know Biden is signing that executive order tomorrow to ramp up lithium and other critical mineral production in the U U.S. And all this, like in the, I've been involved in it for five or six years. And I think we kind of felt it starting to come you know, at us faster and faster a few years ago. And it's, it, that's certainly been the case. I think the, the really big difficulty is that the, there's always this sort of a need for another alternative, like, you know, you talk to people about how electric cars aren't all, you know, great and an amazing solution to our problem, which is a very real problem. And then the next question is, okay, what's the alternative? And, you know, somebody asked that here, which mm -hmm. is a very natural question to ask. And it's very difficult to, to start thinking beyond the sort of technological, like, switches from one kind of car to a different kind of car, or, you know, one kind of extraction to a different kind of extraction, and to start digging deeper into those bigger structures. But I think that's a really big opportunity, too, is what that, what that shows you when you start 
facing the, the reality of extractivism with electrification, you, you have to start thinking about, okay, what else do we need to change? And how will that actually make our lives better in a lot of ways too? So I think that the it's a challenge, but but also an opportunity for being really creative and collaborative. Definitely. And I think something I enjoyed and just took from the presentation that you all gave is like this call, you know, obviously to support these causes, but for us to think in a more globally connected manner, right? And especially I know the pandemic that kind of like heightened that for us, a need to, to think in that way. So, so maybe now is like the time where we can begin that, even though I know, you know, like you're saying tomorrow, this order is being signed, but yeah, just thank you for your work. And I know that part of the reason maybe some of it takes so much is the way that you all work with the communities are being affected. You know, you're not coming in and saying, we're scientists, we know the answer, we're activists, you know, this is how you strategize to like, you know, fight the government. So I also think that the approach is also rooted in something that, you know, like the ethics that you all are wanting to approach the communities that actually are, you know, being impacted because you all come back or you leave and then, you know, then what happens there. So yeah, thank you for that work because obviously, you know, many people don't know that that's happening. We're here in California and we're seeing, you know, these solutions and there's very little awareness I think of what you like behind these ads or behind this solution so so thank you for that and Douglas thank you so much for presenting this I oh, know sure. that we, we reached out to you such a long time ago and, <laughs> and we got to have Noah sure. and I think these these projects together I think fit well really nicely I think that I wish we could have talked more on the science level too about like just fires I wish we could have had someone that could also like kind of maybe create some synergy unfortunately I'm not a climatologist myself otherwise I would have done it but <laughs> Yeah, any final thoughts? Douglas, I know, can you say again where the exhibition is going to be? Maybe some folks can. Uh, the, the exhibition uh, started at the California Museum of Photography, but it opens June 4th at the St. George Museum, which is in St. George, Utah. So it's going to a number of museums across the West where, uh, you know, fires, uh, it'll be in Spokane at the Junt Art Museum and when I talked to the, the curator there initially, he said, yo, yeah, we were blanketed with smoke all of last summer. Yeah, we were really interested in this show. <laughs> so wow. it's, it's, it'll, it'll be in St. George on June 4th. Great, I wish I could go. <laughs> but thank you so much. And hopefully some folks that are here, maybe are in the vicinity and can go. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you for presenting this amazing work and just spreading knowledge. This is the first in our series, Douglas and Jessica. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your night. <laughs> <laughs>